Hello and welcome to My Career in Data, a podcast where we discuss with industry leaders and experts how they have built their careers. I'm your host, Shannon Kemp, and today we're talking to Cindy Kane Fitzgerald from Antioch University. With a robust catalog of courses offered on demand and industry-leading live online sessions throughout the year, the Dataversity Training Center is your launchpad for career success. Browse the complete catalog at training.dataversity.net and use code DVTALKS for 20% off your purchase. Hello and welcome. My name is Shannon Kemp and I'm the Chief Digital Officer at Dataversity and this is My Career in Data, a Dataversity Talks podcast dedicated to learning from those who have careers in data management, to understand how they got there and to be talking with people who help make those careers a little bit easier. To keep up to date in the latest in data management education, go to dataversity.net forward slash subscribe. Today, we are joined by Cindy Kane Fitzgerald, the Manager of Business Intelligence Analytics at Antioch University. And normally, this is where a podcast host would read a short bio of the guest. But today, and in this podcast, your bio is what we're here to talk about. Cindy, hello and welcome. Well, thank you, Shannon. I'm very excited to be here. Oh, I'm so excited for you to be here because I've, I've chatted with you a lot online in webinars and our webinars and stuff. And you've always been a huge uh a part of the data diversity community, which we always appreciate. And now you're going to be speaking at Enterprise Data World in Anaheim. I'm so <laughs> excited about that. I can't wait for your talk. I'm very excited about it too. It's my first time in in um, attending an in-person data diversity event. I'm really oh. looking forward to it. You'll have to let me know what you think afterwards. For I'm sure. excited. <laughs> <laughs> What's your talk going to be? I am going to be discussing the upside to compliance reporting. Ooh. There really is one. I promise. <laughs> I, I see it. it. I see it as an opportunity to really enhance data governance at an institution through the lens of compliance. So that's what I'll oh, be discussing. Very cool. So tell me, uh, Cindy. So you are the manager of business intelligence analytics at Antioch University. Tell me about Antioch University. Sure. Sure. Uh, we're a private, not-for-profit um, higher education institution. We're a multi-campus, multi-state institution with campuses in New England, Ohio, California, in the state of Washington. We also have online and low residency options uh, in undergraduate, graduate, and doctoral programs. We offer degrees, certificates, licensure, and professional development opportunities in a broad range of disciplines, creative writing, education, environmental sciences, leadership, management, transformational change, and counseling psychology and therapy. Oh, very cool. I didn't realize that that you had um, so many campuses. Yeah. And actually, I think that positions me well to talk about compliance because being a multi-state institution really uh, complicates the compliance uh, landscape uh, for our institute. Oh, I'm sure. So then tell me then, so as the uh, manager of business intelligence and analytics, um, what do you do for Antioch and what does your typical work week look like? Well, I'm a fully remote employee, so I spend a lot of time on Zoom, <laughs> yeah. collaborating with colleagues across the country. Um, and I have a pretty broad range of responsibilities. My typical work week has a lot of multitasking on multiple projects. Uh, I build and maintain an enterprise reporting system that is designed to meet both internal assessment needs as well as external compliance needs and Every year around this time, I need to check and see if there have been any changes in compliance requirements that need to be modified in my system. So that's currently happening. I'm managing a data strategy project right now to ensure that we're accurately and consistently capturing critical data related to new strategic initiatives. Uh, we're implementing new budget planning software right now, so I'm working mm. to uh, extract the right data for the integration between those two platforms. And we've just started the annual review of our institutional data glossary, and I'm chairing that process. So that's an example of what this last week looked like. Oh, that's very cool. So you work a lot with data. I do. 
I do. <laughs> so tell me though, Cindy, was this the dream when you were, you know, six years old, very young, you know, did you think to yourself, I'm going to grow up and be a manager of business intelligence and Absolutely. analytics? <laughs> Absolutely. It's the top of my list. No, I wanted to be an actress. That's what I wow. wanted. Yeah. I really yeah. did. Um, but that didn't quite work out for me. So here I am. <laughs> <laughs> let's talk about that journey then so <laughs> <laughs> oh, i love that uh so when as you as you got older you know um and through you know your schooling you know what did your how did your interest types change and then where did you go from what did you start focusing on initially well it's interesting. My background in education is not going to take us anywhere near data. It just isn't because that's what I studied. I'm actually in the field of data management um, and I've been here for 25 years, but I'm here entirely by accident. So really? How did that, how did that, how, do you, so you majored in education? Uh, no, actually I was uh, majored in communication with a women's studies minor at San Francisco oh. State University uh, yeah. after a lot of moving around <laughs> between different types of performing arts. Um, mm -hmm. In San Francisco, I was the director of development for the San Francisco Women's Building. That's what my, I had an entire career as an advancement professional um, before I started working with data. And the dot-com boom was happening. And I did major donor work. So I was on the road all the time and I had a new baby boy and we decided my husband and I to relocate to Vermont, which is where he is from. But there were no remote work options back then. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. in the state of Vermont, um, there's a lot of volunteer work that is uh, tapped to actually do fundraising for nonprofits. So Many of the jobs were only a few hours a week, limited hours, limited salary, limited benefits. So I ended up taking a job with World Learning, the School for International Training, as a database manager. Mm. I didn't have any experience managing a database. <laughs> I didn't have any data management at all experience. But they didn't hire me for data management experience. They hired me because I understood the business needs of a fundraising oh. professional. They uh -huh. hired me because that was what was missing from their technical support, is uh -huh. having somebody who had that business acumen. Um, and as my boss at the time told me, anybody can learn to program, it's just syntax. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, um, most of my learning um, has been on the job. I was a junior programmer for a while at SIT. When Andy up recruited me, I shifted focus more to business analysis and mm -hmm. be a functional analyst for the administrative uh, departments. Shifts at Antioch moved me to be the analyst programmer for just HR and finance. And then in 2014, the Office of Institutional Effectiveness was founded, and I was tapped to become the programmer analyst for OIE. And that's where I still sit today, but my job has evolved to be the manager of the business intelligence uh, analyst. Oh, I love that a lot. And so, so you're searching for a job, you know, <laughs> in this new state for you, right? And And... Trying just trying to find something. So, do they really focus in on? I mean, is whether that the job description just to? I didn't apply. I did not apply for the job that they hired me to do. Oh. <laughs> so, my background in advancement was really focused on personal one-on-one -on -one fundraising. Right. Yeah. Um, although as a director of development, I did grant writing. I did special events. I did the whole gamut. My yeah. specialization was really a major gifts program. And the yeah. position that they were hiring for was a director of corporate and foundation giving. Right. Yeah. So yeah. they didn't see me as right fit just for that job. But over the course of the interview, the uh, chief, the CIO was in the room, was on the hiring committee. And she pulled me aside and said, um, I don't think you're going to be a right fit for this, but I have a position in mind for you if you'd be willing to consider it. And that's what started me on this path today. 
That's so exciting. You know, and and I love that you weren't afraid to say yes and that you dove <laughs> in and, and learned. Did they provide the training or did you just dig in and and a little bit of both? Uh, I went through three different platform transitions, three different migrations with them. So there was always training that came as we were moving from an older system to a newer system, yeah. right? Kind of yeah. focused around the new architecture and the new buttons and gizmos that you needed to use to access your data. Um, yeah. I think, though, starting my career the way I did, I don't know, it just made me less afraid of data as if it was a foreign concept you know what i mean yeah, i really yeah. did buy into you know she taught me some basic oh my very first job working with them was the whole y2k panic i had to go <laughs> hire yeah, I fundraising database and expand all of the two year two character year fields to four character. I mean, by the time I was done with that, I was like, I don't have to do this. I can take the same concept and apply it right into right, right, right. So something about my my backdoor entry into um into this field mm -hmm. allows me, I think, to approach it differently than somebody who studied to be a data architect or studied to be a data scientist. Sure. I'm a real generalist and I think it works. I, I, yeah. And, you know, we've heard a lot of stories like that, you know, just really, you know, to be in data management, you need to understand the business. You need to be curious about the business and, and have that skill in order to be successful. Absolutely. So, yeah. And if you think about it though, Shannon, degrees in this field and certifications in this field, they're relatively new. The CDMP has yeah. only been being offered for the last 25 years. Think yeah. about it in the context of other degrees that you might have pursued or that I might have pursued when I was an undergraduate. There weren't degrees in this yeah. field, right? Yeah. So it's a, it, it's a rapidly changing landscape. And I think flexibility is key to longevity. I agree. Yeah. <laughs> so Cindy, tell me what's your, been your biggest lesson so far in your career? Mm. Tech, the fancy technology, right? Having the right fancy tools and using exactly the right hip language, the right turn of phrase that is, that is hot in our industry at the time. That's helpful, right? They're both helpful, but they don't, replace the need for basic common sense, which for me is at the heart of quality data management, right? I, I like to say to any executive leader who will listen to me, <laughs> that if we don't manage our data as an asset in the same way that we manage our fixed assets and our financial assets, then we risk it becoming a liability. And the problem is data debt is invisible, right? It doesn't show up as red ink in, in, in the balance sheet at the end of the year. So it can, it, it can accrue exponentially without any real understanding of what it is at the executive level. So, so com uh, common sense is pretty important. Um, and then the other thing that I would say is that really understanding the data life cycle is critical. Mm -hmm. um, you can't harvest roses if all you have planted is beans. <laughs> That's another one of my analogies, right? <laughs> right, I, I love it. We reap what we sow in data as in life. And so it's really important that we think strategically about that point at the beginning of the life cycle, data creation, data collection. Are we doing yeah. it in a way that is meaningful and sustainable and meets broad enterprise needs, not just the need for a student to register or a bill to get paid, but thinking about the whole data life cycle. Oh, uh, very true. So, and you mentioned data debt a little bit ago. So, tell, so data debt, tell me a little about data debt. How do you accrue data debt? What is that? I'm still wrapping my head around it, actually. And, uh, I have a fantasy, I have a dream that I'm going <laughs> to develop a model that can be easily adapted mm -hmm. by small institutions like Antioch to help mid-level administrators like me express data debt in a meaningful way to the executive suite so they can understand it. But I'll give you a real practical example. Um, 
Antioch is, ha, is a multi-campus institution. And not that long ago, our institutional governance was completely decentralized. Every campus had a board, a president, a registrar. Mm -hmm. Every campus had a faculty senate, their own academic calendar, their own academic catalog. All of that data lived in a single ERP system, but it was managed according to campus specific right, processes uh -huh. and values. The upshot was that um, not only did we have the silo data that you anticipate that many of us see where it's siloed by business function from HR mm -hmm. to finance to you know academic affairs, we had additional silos that were campus-based. And we ended up, um, a campus our size, I think we had a little over 150 unique department values. And mm -hmm. we don't have 158 departments. <laughs> we just had 158 ways of describing the departments that we do have. Uh -huh. So I use the analogy that if we had a department called blue, one school called it teal, and one school called it navy, and HR called it aqua. And therefore, there was no way for us to aggregate up and get that 30,000 foot view in our analytics that executives are always looking for. So that's data debt. It's invisible because people like me for years simply made it work. So the executives were able to get the reports they needed. They just didn't have any idea how long it took and how much uh -huh. labor was actually involved. And the fact that that process couldn't really be replicated because it wasn't relying on any consistency in the data. We just underwent um, a pretty big project. We updated over 2 million data points in our uh, system of record. And I am happy to say that all departments in all, depart in all business units across multiple platforms are now consistent. So that's wow. us erasing some data debt. But it was a big investment to get rid of it. It would have been a lot cheaper to plan for it at the beginning. Oh, that makes so much so much sense. And I love that you have that you're dreaming about it. <laughs> I love the, the solution. If you right. figure out that solution, will you let me know? <laughs> I will publish it far and wide. <laughs> you bet. <laughs> oh, that's awesome. Visit dataversity.net and expand your knowledge with thousands of articles and blogs written by industry experts, plus free live and on-demand webinars covering the complete data management spectrum. While you're there, subscribe to the weekly newsletter so you'll never miss a beat. So so tell me, Cindy, you know, um, what is your definition of data itself? And, and That's a good question because I think it's changing all the time. Right. Mm -hmm. uh, so I, I don't think I have a, a, a static definition of data other than perhaps this. Data is information that we need to access in some way, understand mm -hmm. in some way, and then take action on in some way. But maybe that's an image or maybe that's a set of images or maybe that's a file or maybe it's a date or a year or some of the other concepts that we traditionally think of as data. And I think I've already described to you that I'm a little bit of an odd bird. I'm a little bit IT. I'm a little bit end <laughs> user, right? And I don't have technical training or background in this field. It's, um, it's all sort of hands-on DIY, right? I learn a lot from the Dataversity talks that I uh -huh. attend. Um, but I do a broad range of working with data. I work with um, end users to clarify what their business needs are and to mm -hmm. document them clearly and then connect those needs to the available technology. Um, I <laughs> help them create procedures so that we can maintain high data quality. But then I can also translate all of that into technical requirements. I can either hand that off to another programmer or I can take those technical requirements myself and build what needs to be built. And then once we have all of that, I can work with it at the back end and develop reports, develop um, a BI environment that those reports can uh, 
uh, read from and um, set up reports to be delivered. And I kind of do all of that over the course of my week. I spend a lot of time on governance, though. And I have to say, I know that there's a lot of mixed feelings about it, but I'm a fan. I really like my work in data governance a lot. Oh, I love that. Yeah. And I know I, there's a lot of people who, uh, you know, we, we get questions about this all the time and you've seen it in the webinars too. Like, you know, my boss thinks that data governance is a dirty word. They don't want to go anywhere near it, you know, like, but it's such a good thing, right? I mean, at the end of the day, it helps to resolve those things like data debt and it helps so much in, in providing value to the business. Absolutely. So here's a great example. At Antioch, we, uh, like most institutions, we have an academic year that has a start and an end. Like yeah. most other enterprises, we have a fiscal year that has a start yeah. and an end. Our, ours yeah. don't happen to align, <laughs> right? So you need to know that and understand that if you are trying to bring together uh, mm -hmm. data from the academic side of the house with data from the finance side of the house, you need to realize that there's a slight overlap and a mismatch. It's that can occur in data governance, right? That kind right. of conversation can happen in a data governance conversation where it's unlikely to happen in, in other administrative meetings. And I am fascinated by those conversations. I really enjoy those types of conversations. <laughs> Oh, I love that, Cindy. And, and you made the point too, right? Data governance is not just about following the letter of the law and, and complying with, with legal matters, right? Which is why so many people are like, oh, I just don't want to deal with this, you know, which it just sounds not fun, but it can be so much fun. And it, so. Yeah, I, I think, so for many, they, they think of data governance as simply getting to the point where you have policy. Mm -hmm. And then we're done. We, we've, we've got a privacy policy. We've got a security policy. But I would argue that if you don't have procedures that align with that policy, then you're not done, right? right. You have to take it to the practice. You have to take it to the, you have to make sure that your people processes reflect your governance policy. Yeah. Yeah. yeah very true. So Cindy, do you see the importance of data management and the number of jobs working with data increasing or decreasing over the next 10 years and why? It's, uh, hmm. Well, I see the importance increasing be exponentially with the with the, with the growth of uh, our data sets and all the different platforms that we all need to navigate these yep. days, right? Uh, data is the new oil, right? Isn't that what they said recently in The Economist? And it's true. I'm really interested to see what's going to happen in the next couple of years in the field of data management as it relates to AI. Mm -hmm. But honestly, I'm not sure AI can ever replace people, mm -hmm. fully replace them. Um, every single example that I've given you in this interview, AI couldn't have untangled the knots that we had tied ourselves into, right? It took people, and not me, not person, it took people coming together thinking together outside of their own area, putting mm -hmm. on a completely different hat, looking through a completely different lens, right? Mm -hmm. And having a conversation that helped lead us to a better place with our data. And I know there's a certain amount of that that can happen with AI, but I, I just don't think that process can ever fully be replaced. Um, our data is here to stay. They're going to need people like us to wrangle it for them whoever they may be. <laughs> I absolutely agree. And, you know, we're seeing a lot of that. You know, so many companies are trying to stand up all these really cool tools and tech, especially in analytics. And uh, and suddenly are realizing that they forgot the data prep. They forgot the data governance to drive the data quality. And went, oops, wait, oh, we also need a data model. <laughs> we also need a... <laughs> <laughs> right. We may need somebody to manage and create all that, <laughs> create the model, to design the architecture, and to, you know, ensure that we have processes in place to drive data quality. Right, and to make sure that when we say blue, we all understand what blue means. Mm -hmm. One of us doesn't think it's purple. <laughs> right, <laughs> it's called blue. Right. Uh, I love those analogies. <laughs> so, Cindy, what advice would you? give to people looking to get into a career in data management? 
Mm. Uh, well, I think that understanding the business need is essential. Mm-hmm. So developing your skill set as an as a business analyst is a really important beginning. I would say that understanding the data life cycle is critical and understanding that the uh, investment early in that life cycle pays off, that your biggest return on investment is investing time in the creation and collection phase. And then I see that tools and technology and language change rapidly, but the fundamentals generally stay the same. Yeah. Very, very nice. (laughs) Very good advice. (laughs) You know, and I, you know, I I would argue too, you know, like that we're seeing a lot, you know, I'm learning a lot from these interviews, you know, just that curiosity. Like you talk about, so, you know, finding out what are the business needs, not assuming, not dictating, just what are they? And then trying to meet those needs. There's a real talent to eliciting business needs because people are prone to coming to you with a solution in mind. They know Uh what their need is and they've already decided the solution. You just need to build it for them. And it's not uncommon for that solution to just not be feasible given the data architecture that you have or the tools that you have available or the resources Uh or the timeline, right? So really helping them, really digging out, well, what is it that you're trying to get? What is it that you need to do? Say more about, you know, asking those open-ended questions and giving them space to really explore what their need is rather than focusing on them telling you what I really need is an API (laughs) that does these five things, right? back up to why you need the API and how it's going to help you in your work. And then that's going to help me get you the right tool. Very true. Well, Cindy, this has been such a pleasure. I've really enjoyed talking with you. I've enjoyed this as well, Shannon. Thank you for the opportunity. Oh, well, thanks for joining me. And thanks for participating so much and, and, and being such a great uh, networker and, and, Uh, in our webinars and such, and being such a great part of the community. Mm -hmm. I'll see you you in a couple of months. Yeah, a couple of weeks. What? No. Yeah. (laughs) It is, isn't it? (laughs) It is. I know. It's coming up so fast. You know, the third week of September. Yeah. And Anaheim. There you go. I'll see see you then. (laughs) Yeah, I'm excited. We'll meet meet in person. Yeah. So. <laughs> oh, well, Cindy, thank you so much for taking the time to chat with us today. And again, for all of our listeners out there, if you'd like to keep up to date on the latest in podcast and the latest in data management education, you may go to dataversity.net forward slash subscribe. Until next time. Thank you for listening to Dataversity Talks, a podcast brought to you by Dataversity. Subscribe to our newsletter for podcast updates and information about our free educational webinars at dataversity.net forward slash subscribe.